Welcome to Challenging Climate, a podcast where we discuss the science, technology, and politics of climate change. I'm Pete Irvin, a climate scientist. And I'm Jesse Reynolds, an environmental policy expert. Each episode, we bring on a guest with a unique perspective and deep expertise on climate change and put challenging questions to them. In this episode, we invited uh, Gavin Schmidt on. Uh, the vision I had for this episode was to take our first sort of deep dive into the science of climate change. I thought a great place to start would be global temperature. You know, how do we know that the planet's warming? How do we observe that? How do we detect changes? And how do we attribute them to human effects? And I thought, who better than Gavin Schmidt, who's been working for decades on climate change, looking back in time and into the future, and also working a lot to communicate climate change through the Real Climate blog and elsewhere. I'm particularly interested in Gavin's communication work, where I see him striking about the right balance in pushing back against climate change deniers, skeptics, and genuine resistance to taking climate action, while also not being afraid of criticizing those who rely excessively on worst case scenarios as a potentially misguided effort to motivate climate change policy. Before we start the episode with Gavin, if you're enjoying this podcast, please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere, and please consider supporting us on Patreon. We've enjoyed researching these topics and recording our discussions, but there's a lot of editing, producing, and other work that comes along with making a podcast. With your help, we can pay for professional support, which will make this podcast sustainable for us in the long run. We don't want to have ads in these podcasts, so we're hoping that those who can will chip in a few dollars or pounds a month to help us keep the show going. Go to patreon.com slash challengingclimate, that's all one word, to help support the show. Thank you. Dr. Gavin Schmidt is the director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and the principal investigator for the Institute's Model E, Earth System Model. He has an extensive publication record covering many aspects of past, present, and future climate change. Gavin has also devoted considerable effort to climate communication, founding the Real Climate blog with colleagues, and he has won the inaugural AGU Climate Communication Prize for his efforts. Gavin, welcome to Challenging Climate. Thank you very much. So let's begin with your background. How did you end up studying Earth System Sciences and landing at the Goddard Institute? So I started off as a mathematician uh, when I was uh, in high school. Really, all I wanted to do was, was mathematics, mathematical problems, and you know, thinking about that kind of stuff. And so, so when I came to going to college, you know, I there was no there was no big decision for me. I you know I wanted to, to get a math degree, and I did that. I you know got introduced to uh, to real pure mathematics. Uh, thought that that was terribly boring, and then kind of moved to applied mathematics, fluid mechanics particularly, and thought, oh, this is cool. I can I can do this. Then you know I didn't really know what to do. I bummed around the world for a couple of years, uh, and I came back and I thought, well, you know, I'm a bit bored. I'll, you know, maybe I should do a PhD. And uh, and I went to uh, the uh, the math department at uh, UCL in London and uh, and said uh, to them, oh, you know, can I do a PhD with you? And uh, and and they they were they were they were a little surprised. They said, no, well, there's there's an application process. The deadline was months ago. What do you do? You can't just walk in here and ask to do a PhD. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think this is? And I go, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't want to mess up your process. But they said, well, you can go and ask that guy over there. And so I went over to that guy over there, and he said, well, I just got this thing funded. When can you start? And it turned out to be a project looking at, you know, a certain kind of uh, wave that is important uh, in kind of transmitting, you know, the information from El Nino events up and down the coast. And, uh, and uh, you know, so it was kind of an oceanographic application, but it was very, it was very pure, you know, very, very idealized view of what the real world was like. But, but it was an ocean problem. And so suddenly I was an oceanographer, which was uh, a little bit odd because I didn't really know anything really much about, about the ocean. And, uh, 
But I found that people were suddenly much more interested in what I was doing than when I told them I was a mathematician, which kind of turned people off entirely. But you say, oh, you're an oceanographer, and they start asking you about marine mammals, which I still know nothing about. And so, you know, I got, I got a taste for, you know, doing problems that started to become interesting to people. And so, you know, by the time I finished my PhD, you know, maybe four people in the world cared about what, my, what was in my PhD. And, uh, and so I'm looking for a job and, uh, you know, and somebody says, well, uh, yeah, you know, that looks all very nice, but, you know, but we're doing climate now, you know, that's the up and coming thing. So, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about the, you know, the stability of the ocean circulation and uh, pay your climate changes. And I said, well, that sounds fascinating. And I had really no idea what I was signing up for, but uh, it was the only job I was offered. So, uh, so, so that's, where I, uh, that's where I ended up. And that was in Montreal and McGill University. And there, they were just starting off with a new climate center. And so they were bringing in people who, for, from all kinds of applications of climate science and, 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 and impacts. And so it was this great education on all things climate, from deep time, paleoclimate, to chemistry, to the stratosphere, to the deep ocean, to climate models, to observations, satellites. And, and you know, and I, I was just, I was just soaking this stuff up. It was great. And, you know, the work I did there was, you know, slightly, slightly more applied, slightly more real, slightly more dimensions, if you like, compared to what I'd done as a PhD. And, and I started to like that. And as I kind of moved forward, I started to want to become, to be doing more and more realistic efforts. And so I ended up at, uh, at, at GIS, uh, which is in New York City, for various reasons that, that aren't very germane to this conversation, where I started working on these big climate models, these big three-dimensional climate models that try and have everything in the kitchen sink thrown in, because we know that you know, almost all of those things matter for certain aspects of, of the problem. You know, the chemistry matters for understanding what happens to methane. The, the aerosols matter if you want to understand what's going on with clouds. The, you know, yeah, so you can abstract a lot from those big complex models and, and make kind of neat stories. But really, if you want to know how something is going to work out when all of the different factors are at play, you need to have all of the different factors in play and you need to end up with these very, very complex and expensive in time models. And so I've been working on that and, and it turns out that I'm quite good at that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of mathematical issues that, uh, that arise there. And so it wasn't really that much of a stretch from, from what I was doing before, but the, but the applications and the interest in what was being done increased enormously. Well, I think you're the perfect guest then to do what we hope to do, which is a, a deep dive on global warming and human influence on it. So I want to start off with a very basic question, which I think has got some complexities behind it. What is global mean temperature and how do we measure it? Uh, well, we don't measure it directly. So global mean temperature is basically the average temperature at the surface of the Earth averaged over the whole surface, right? So it's, it's a it's a kind of a mathematical construct. And the reason why we're interested in that number is because uh, we can tie a lot of things that change in the world to changes in that one metric. And so when, uh, when people started doing uh, modeling of the Earth, that was one of the things that they got from the models. And they said, okay, well, if you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by such and such, then the then the global mean temperature is going to increase by this. And so people uh, at the time, say in the late 70s, started thinking about, well, can we actually estimate how much the global mean temperature is changing? Do we have enough information from the observations to be able to do that? And so in parallel with the models predicting changes to this quantity, uh, people started working on, well, how do you estimate that quantity? And so people started off with the weather station network. And then they said, well, okay, well, but that's not really enough. You need information from the oceans. And so they integrated information from, uh, from ships and ocean buoys and, uh, and now like the float program. And you now all those things came in. And, and as those things have become integrated, people have found problems. People have found problems with you know, changes in instruments that have a slightly different behavior, changes in practices that impart you know, a slight bias this way or that way to the temperatures. And so it's been a, a work in progress for about, you know, I'd say you know, 30 years or so to get estimates that we think are robust 
and now they are. I mean, so now we have tens of thousands of weather stations that go into that. We have uh, millions of ocean measurements that go into that. We have methodologies that kind of stitch these things together that take into account as many of the non-climatic biases in, in the data set that we can that we can find. And we have good error models for these things. And now, you know, it doesn't really matter who does it or how they do it in detail. They all produce basically the same result. And that result is that, you know, since the uh, late 19th century, temperatures, the global mean temperature has increased by, uh, by over a degree Celsius since that time. And since the 1970s, has basically been steadily increasing at around, you know, 0.2 degrees per decade or something. One thing I'd like to sort of uh, get into a bit more on is this, the question of gaps. Because you mentioned the weather network, and I, I imagine that's very dense around cities in Europe and America, but there are quite large patches of the world that are not so populated. So the Arctic, for example. How do you go from a set of I mean, thermometers at different locations, effectively? How do you fill in between them? And how does that, how does that work? So there's some neat things about the physics of this that make that problem a little bit less challenging than you might think. Uh, so one of the things that you see is that on an annual or, or, uh, or even monthly basis, if one station here is a little bit warmer than normal, then a station a little bit further, uh, that, you know, like 100 miles away, 200 miles away, is also seeing a very similar pattern. Uh, and it turns out that the size of those patterns, you know, whether the planet is warmer or cooler, is, is very large. It, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's on the order of, you know, a thousand kilometers. The, the, basically, the scale of big weather systems. And so that means that, you know, if I have a network of stations, they all basically kind of go up and down together as the weather does its thing. Right, and as the, the climate does its thing, and and that has very large scale patterns. So, so for instance, if I got like five stations in an area, you know, like two thousand kilometers by two thousand kilometers, right? It's quite a large area. They will all look very similar, except sometimes four of them will be doing this, and then one of them will be doing boom, that, and you go, okay, well, something went a little bit wrong there, right? And and then you can say, okay, well. We, we can isolate, you know, individual stations where something odd may have happened, where somebody wrote down a number wrong, or they changed the machine, or they moved the station. We can detect those things kind of statistically. And so we can correct for that. And then we can fill in the rest of the space. You know, if, if four stations, five stations are all doing the same thing, then somewhere in the middle, well, that's also doing the same thing. And so you can do that and then check, you know, if you have a station that you left out, can you predict what happened at that station successfully? And the answer is, uh, yes, yes, you can. And so for places like the Arctic, we have got stations that go all the way up to the, uh, the Arctic coast. And we also have data that's been collected on the ice, like kind of floating platforms. And, we, and we've had, you know, various countries have had kind of ice stations since the 1950s, at least, that, uh, that can be used as validation data. And so, and so, th so that's what we use. We, we basically you know, interpolate across areas where we don't have information, and then we can evaluate that and validate that against the spot measurements that we have from different platforms. And then we can compare all of that to what we get from uh, satellites. Right? So we have, we have satellites that since you know, the, the early 2000s that will give us an estimate of surface air temperature changes uh, everywhere in the world. And so we can then match, okay, what's the satellite saying over that short period to what we're inferring from the weather stations? And if it's a good match, then we can go backwards and then fill in that data going all the way back to the 19th century. Obviously, as you go back to the 19th century, there is less information and there's more assumptions, so the error bars increase, but we can quantify that quite well. And, and none of the quantifications of those changes, those errors or those, those uncertainties, uh, really put into question the, the, the large trend that you've seen over the last over the last hundred years, I mean, give you a sense. You know, the the annual anomaly uh, this year or last year, we can estimate that to within, you know, maybe 0 0.05 Celsius. Whereas, uh, you know, if you go back to the 19th century, then it's plus or minus maybe point 
0.15 Celsius, maybe 0.2 right at, right at the beginning. But that's, those are all small numbers compared to the 1.2 degrees warming that we've seen since the 19th century. So the uncertainties don't affect the large-scale conclusions. I'm going to pepper in a few of the old or still current climate denial talking points and see, and you've been working on climate communication a while, and um, I think you've got ready answers to many of these. Yeah, no, they're, they're all old points. Like they're, they're, I haven't heard a new climate denial point in maybe a decade. Okay, well, this is a classic. So one of the biases that I think was talked about a lot was the, the urban heat island bias. Could you explain what the idea is behind that and how it was corrected for? So that's, that's a real thing. I mean, so cities are generally a little bit warmer than the countryside around them because they're very urban. There's, uh, there's more stone than there is grass. The albedo is different. There's a lot of energy generation within a city, right? So there's actual heat in the city that makes it warmer. And, you know, if you walk across the city, you can detect these things. I mean, if you walk, I mean, I live in New York, you know, if I'm, if I'm walking on the Upper West Side and I walk into Central Park, you can, on a hot summer's day, you can instantly feel that it's like a degree or so colder in the park. So the urban heat island effect is something that people have known about for very for maybe a century. It's a very old idea and it's something that people have dealt with a lot. Right? So so the issue for the global mean temperature changes is whether cities have urbanized, have become more urban, and the urban heat island effect has become more of a problem in recent times. So, so you, can, you can detect that in certain city sites. And so one of the ways to deal with that is to not use central city sites in the global analyses. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty straightforward. It doesn't make, makes a small difference, doesn't make a huge difference. And then you can like kind of try and uh, see, okay, well, how are the rural stations matching up to the urban stations? You can try and correct the urban stations for, the, for those trends. And again, you know, you, you, you do that and it just doesn't add up to a very large number because we have a lot of rural stations. We have a lot of places and, and the vast majority of the ocean is not, in fact, in a city. And so when you put together all of the ocean data, you put together these corrections, it makes a small impact, but it's not a very large effect. And then when you test that against the satellite data that has none of the, you know, you, you're not using the city data more widely than just the exact point where that city is, uh, what you see are the same trends. And so, you know, there, there, isn't a, um, there isn't a residual urban heat island effect left in these, uh, in, these, in these products. I guess I want to just do the big picture. In the latest IPCC report, the, the physical science basis, they had the statement, it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. And that was the strongest such statement so far from the IPCC. Could you just explain why is it now unequivocal? Right. So the fact that it's been warming was unequivocal in the last report <laughs> because we have not just the, the weather stations, not just the ocean data, but the melting glaciers and the movement of the ecosystems and the change in the hardiness indexes and like all of the different things that go along with warming, the sea level rise, the melting of the sea ice, uh, all of those things are, are moving in the same direction unequivocally, right? So the, uh, the attribution of that change is very interesting. How, how do we go about doing that? And, and, and basically, we adopt a, a kind of a CSI planet Earth approach, right? We have a crime scene, right? You know, we've got this, 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 this very large warming. And, and the question is, who done it? And there's a, a multiple of, uh, of, of suspects, you know. It could be the sun. It could be the ocean doing its thing. It could be volcanoes not doing their thing. It could be the wobbles in the Earth's orbit. And, and if you go back in paleoclimate, you know, all of those things have left very clear fingerprints in, in the climate record. You know, we can, we can see the impact of the sun. We can see the impact of the, the Earth's wobbles. We can see the impacts of massive asteroids. We can see the impacts of, of changes in greenhouse gases, deforestation, changes in the continents. All of those things have impacted climate in the past. And so, so we don't lack for suspects. And so what we want to do is we want to test all of those things. Like, what, is, what would we expect if the changes in the sun were, were causing the climate change? What would we expect if the orbital wobbles were causing it? What would we expect if it was volcanoes or if it was the ocean or if it was something else, right? And we can, we can calculate those things. Like, so we know what the sun has done over the last 100 years. You know, we've had observations of, of sunspots and aurora and uh, 
and since 1979, direct measurements of, of solar irradiance. We know what it's been doing. And then we can estimate what impact that would have. And one of the interesting things about the, the sun is that if the sun becomes brighter and more active, uh, you expect that the, the whole atmosphere will, will warm. And, you know, and it would warm in the stratosphere and in the mesosphere at the same time that it was warming at the surface. Okay, that's, that's interesting. But it turns out that if you look at what happens if you change carbon dioxide, it has a very different pattern. Carbon dioxide is a kind of an interesting molecule because what happens at the surface is that, yes, the extra greenhouse gases warm the surface, but because of some peculiarities of the upper atmosphere, it cools the upper atmosphere. And so you get this cooling aloft, warming below pattern. Okay, well, that's quite different to the pattern that you get from the sun. If you look at the pattern that you get from volcanoes, or, or then, you know, then you get a, a, a different pattern again. If you look at the pattern that you get from, from ocean variability, again, it's a different pattern. And so you can, uh, you can calculate all those different patterns and you can say, well, let's look at the observations, which ones fit? And it turns out that the stratosphere has been cooling a ton and the ocean has been warming as well as the atmosphere has been warming. And if you match up what you expect from the greenhouse gas changes that we've put into the atmosphere, you put in like yeah, where, the, where the volcanoes were, you put in the, the solar uh, changes, you put in the El Nino events, what you end up with is that the trends that we have seen over the last 150 years are entirely due to the rise in greenhouse gases, entirely. And so, you know, so when people will say, well, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's halfway, maybe, I, I, you know, that it, it's nonsense. There's no, there's no evidence that any substantial amount of the trend that we've seen is due to anything else other than the greenhouse gases. I started my career in climate science in 2009, and that was the time when the warming hadn't gone out quite as expected. The 1998 was the hottest year on record, and no temperature had the global temperature hadn't got past that for a few years. I think at first people were like, oh, it's natural variability, it's fine. But by the time I started my PhD, there seemed to be the beginning of a serious academic discussion of just why is the warming not happening in the way that we perhaps expected. So what was this um, hiatus in warming? Was there really a pause in warming and uh, what, what caused it? So, so the sociology of this was quite interesting and, uh, and, uh, and you came in at a very interesting time. So there's three kind of strands that were kind of floating around. One was that, yes, you know, 1998 had been this very large El Nino event, massive warming, clearly by far the warmest year on record until that point. And obviously the next year was, 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 was cooler. And so, you know, people, you know, instantly started saying, oh, well, look, global warming has stopped because I can draw a line from the peak of 1998 down. And, uh, and initially people said, well, of course, you know, that's just, that's just internal variability. That's just the El Ninos and La Ninas. And, uh, you know, that's not really anything to worry about or, or really kind of, there's nothing really to say. And so people didn't pay it much mind. But then, you know, we, we started to see a divergence in the global mean temperature products as well. And so there were some, there were some products that kind of, you know, seemed low and then others seemed high. And if you took the ones that seemed lower, then it started to come out, not quite out of the noise, but it, but it seemed to be kind of like, you know, kind of bouncing along the bottom of what we would have expected from the models. And the models have all of this internal variability in them. So you can ask the models, you know, how likely is it that in a 10-year period, you know, you're, that it will cool over a 10-year period, even if the long-term trends are warming. And so we weren't outside of that noise, but we were kind of like, you know, bouncing along the bottom there. If you were looking at these, the, you know, there were, there were two particular um, data sets that people were looking at. And so, you know, it starts to get a little bit interesting because scientists are intrigued by things that don't quite fit, right? Because, you know, everybody, everybody understands that, you know, it's those little things that don't quite fit that sometimes give you this like big insight and something new that's going on, right? So you think of general relativity, you think of, you know, minor issues in the, uh, in the orbit of Mercury, you know, that nobody really cares about intrinsically, but, but they're a signal that something might be, might be happening, right? And so when things start to get to that kind of that two sigma level, right? So it's, so it's not totally impossible that this would happen normally, but it's starting to get a little bit unlikely. 
people start to kind of kind of jump in, and and they, and they often jump in with their own pet theory. Right, so so the people that think that you know there's there's a big ocean internal variability signal kind of jumped in and said, well, this is obviously a big ocean internal variability signal. The people that uh, that thought that the models were uh, were all wrong jumped in and said, oh, well, the models are all wrong. So our our basic expectation was was wrong. The people that uh, you know that that thought a lot about the uh, the data sets started looking into the data sets and saying, well, maybe the data sets are not doing something optimal. Particularly, particularly in the Arctic, as as as, as we mentioned before, and and the, and the data set that was mostly used there was one in which they didn't do any extrapolation, and so they had this huge part of the Arctic without any data. But because the de- the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the world, that actually gives them a cool bias in their data set. And so then people said, well, you know, maybe you need to deal with those biases in that data set. And so there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of work done uh, where people kind of yeah, you know, tried to look at different ways that you could reconcile things. And you know, there were there were other things, you know, the models perhaps they had uh, they'd assumed, you know, constant amounts of solar activity and in fact solar activity had dipped a little bit, so that made them a little bit warmer. It, there was a bit of a an unforced error in how they did the volcanoes and they didn't really have enough volcanic aerosols. So that was another warming thing. Anyway, so you, you add it all together and there was like a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. So there was, there was like a small little set of things everywhere. But when you kind of added it all up, the, the whole thing kind of just goes away. And so by the time that people had updated their observational data sets to deal with all the issues in those, it didn't make a very big error. It didn't make a very big difference, but it, but it made enough of a difference. By the time the models dealt with the solar forcing and the volcanoes forcing better, uh, well, that made a little bit of a difference, not very much of a difference. But, you know, all of this kind of added up. And so by the time, you know, you come around to 2014, 2015, you know, the whole thing had just kind of evaporated. And then, you know, we had 2014, 2015, 2016, all of which uh, were the warmest years on record by a lot, right? And so, so the whole, oh, it's been cooling since 1998 thing just evaporated because that just disappeared as a talking point. And now, you know, this, you, you'll see those same folks, the exact same folks saying now, oh, well, it's been cooling since 2016. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's, not, that's just as untrue as it was in 1998. Well, let's go a little further back in time. So another warming pulse or cooling period was the mid 20th century. Now here, earlier you were saying you can attribute the warming to the greenhouse effect, but humanity has another effect, which is more uncertain, the aerosol forcing effect. And I believe that's to do with this with this warming pulse in the mid-century. Do you want to elaborate on that? So, you know, humans are actually having many, many different impacts on, on the planet. You know, where, uh, you know, we deforested, uh, that, had, that has an impact. Uh, land use change, urbanization that has a that has an impact. Uh, greenhouse gases, but also, as you mentioned, air pollution. Right, so smog and particles that that get put into the atmosphere, acid rain. You know that that has a uh, that has a clear uh, climatic signal. And so, so when we're doing like the 20th century, we have to do all of those things in the the post Second World War period. Industrial activity ramped up enormously, uh, particularly in the in the developed world, and it was not clean. It was pretty dirty industry. There was a lot of coal burning, and at the time, there's a lot of high sulfur coal. So when the coal was burned, it didn't just produce carbon dioxide, but it also produced uh, sulfur dioxide, which became sulfuric acid, which became acid rain, but also became particles. And it turns out that little particles of sulfuric acid are white. And so when the sun comes down, they reflect the air away. And so when you're in a polluted environment, you end up cooling the surface underneath that. And, and that, was a, that was a big deal. Like throughout the 60s and 70s, the amount of air pollution that we were putting into the atmosphere was increasing quite dramatically until it became such a problem that the Clean Air Acts were passed in Europe and in the US and in Japan that uh, mandated that when you burnt coal, you, you reduced the amount of sulfur dioxide that was put out. And that reduced the acid rain problem. It also reduced the amount of aerosols. Kind of from the 1940s onwards, you had this increasing aerosol 
effect, which was a cooling factor. And that was kind of balancing the increases in greenhouse gases for a couple of decades. And so, and you can see the, the, the signature of that because it had, it had a different pattern of warming and cooling than the, the pattern you get from greenhouse gases. Mainly it was in the Northern Hemisphere. It wasn't so much in the South. And so you had this hemispheric asymmetry that was, that was a bit of a clue. You can see in the ice cores in Greenland and in the Alps, you know, you can see this big buildup of, of aerosol particles. And so you can, you can match the net changes in the human effects to the temperature changes that we did see. And so, so when you run the models through that, you do see this kind of slight cooling from the 1940s to the 1970s that is actually kind of directly matched by what you expect based on the greenhouse gases going up, but also the aerosol pollution going up. And then when the aerosol pollution stopped going up, then you know, you've, you've basically kind of unmasked the, uh, the effects of the greenhouse gases. And so since then, there's been this, this much more steady warming effect. Going further back still, if I'm right, there was part of the warming that we see in the early 20th century is attributed to a lack of cooling, as in there was a, a surge of volcanic activity in the late 19th, early 20th century that some believe might be part of the early 20th century. I might have that wrong, but perhaps just speak of, you know, what role has volcanic forcing had on the, on the climate in the last century or two? Yeah, so I, th- so I think your timing might be a little bit off. So there was there was a period at the beginning of the 19th century where there was a, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of big volcanoes, uh, uh, notab- notably uh, Tambora, which erupted in I think June 1815. That, that had uh, climate impacts all around the world for for the next couple of years, very big effect. There was another volcano that we're not quite sure where it was that that appeared in 1809 that also had an effect. So there was a kind of like a double whammy of volcanic effects. And so you can see, you can see this very clearly, uh, both in the instrumental record, but also in, in, in proxy records like tree rings and, and the like. And we know that, that those big volcanoes, you know, happen. I mean, there was one in, in, the, in the late 19th century, um, 1883, Krakatoa, that has a that has a clear signal in the record uh, as well. There was there was a couple in the in there was I think there's one in 19, 1909 that had an impact, but but in the more rod, modern period, Mount Agung in 1963, El Chichon in 82, and Mount Pinatubo, which was the biggest one in the 20th century, in 1991, and you can see very clear impacts of those of those volcanoes on the record. Another climate skeptic talking point is uh, variations in the sun's output. The sun's output varies over time in the relatively short time scale, but also over longer time scales. What role has the sun played in recent, the recent decades? And uh, what role has it played in the deeper past? I'm thinking in particular, the Little Ice Age. There's some, some belief that that's connected with uh, what's called the Maunder Minimum. Could you uh, explain that? Yeah, so uh, I mean, you're right. So the uh, the evidence is that the sun has uh, both short term cycles, so the, the the solar cycle, right? It's about eleven years solar cycle, but then a, a kind of a modulation of that over time. And so if you look at the 20th century, where we have good records, the solar activity kind of peaked in the 1950s and has been declining a little bit since then, which is like totally contradictory to the warming that we've had since then. So uh, the notion that, that solar activity is responsible for the late 20th century warming is, is, is just a non-starter. Uh, but if you go back further, you can see modulations in, in the sunspot records, which are our best record going back to about 1610, when Galileo first like, started noticing the sunspots because he just invented the telescope. Right Up until then, people had not really noticed these things. Uh, so from about 1610 onwards, we have a, a record of sunspots. And there was a period in the late 17th century where there were no sunspots seen, which was kind of interesting. And that was called the Maunder Minimum. And that kind of coincided with a, with a, with a cool period. But the Little Ice Age actually was, was, was a much broader period from that. And, you know, and there's some evidence that you, know, you really started to see you know, what you would consider to be the Little Ice Age from the, from the 13th century. And that's tied to another big volcanic eruption in 1257 from uh, uh, Samalas. And so and you can see, you know, when I mentioned, I mentioned the Tambora uh, in the early uh, 19th century, kind of, and so, so that's the, the twin ends of what people consider to be the, uh, the Little Ice Age actually were bracketed by big volcanic eruptions, not by, not by solar variability. But, you know, solar variability is a very interesting topic. You know, we've written a number of papers about the mechanisms of how changes in the sun kind of affect the climate. You know, one of the key things is that uh, the changes in the sun are much larger in the UV than they are in the visible or in 
or in the total uh, energy. And so, so you get a, uh, an ozone response in the stratosphere, which amplifies the impact there. But when you look at what the, the temperature measurements or the ozone measurements in the stratosphere have done that we can look at from satellites oh, since, you know, in the last 40 years, and then you look at what the models are doing, you know, they're, they're right, right? They're not, they're, not, they're not wrong. I mean, we're not missing some major, major mechanism of solar amplification. You know, we've, we've looked at the impact of solar energetic particles that has a small impact on, troposphere, on stratospheric chemistry. We've looked at the impact of, of cosmic rays uh, on ionization. There's a tiny, tiny effect. We've looked at the impact of, you know, ozone changes, which is a bigger effect, but, but really doesn't penetrate to the surface very well. So, so we can see, we can see the, the, the signature of solar forcing in the stratosphere very, very clearly. And then by the time it gets to the, the troposphere, like the surface where we are, it's a much, much smaller thing and it's much noisier. On, on really long time scales, then, you know, the sun has warmed or become more active by about 30% over the last 4 billion years, right? So that's a slightly different time scale. But the sun has warmed, but the planet has not. And so it, so it turns out that over those kind of billion year time scales, you, you have this kind of interesting interplay between greenhouse gases and the sun. And so as the sun has, has brightened over that very, very long time frame, the amount of greenhouse gases has gone down. And so the temperature of the earth has stayed, I mean, not exactly stable, but within the, the habitable bounds, luckily for us. So yes, I mean, so, you know, the sun's obviously, uh, you know, a big deal in climate. <laughs> I mean, I, what, what, I find, what I find really amusing is sometimes, you know, uh, you know, climate scientists, climate skeptics will come up to us and say, but don't you see that thing in the sky? Don't you get that this is obviously... Uh, it's like, yeah, yes, yeah, we're, all, we're aware that the energy comes from the sun. Thank you. <laughs> and we're aware that it varies and we, we look at that. But it just does not, it just, it, it doesn't have the right, timing or fingerprints to match what's been happening in recent decades. We've already got past the observational record now, going back in time. So how do we do that? How do we go further back in time to recreate what we think the climate of the past was? Well, there are many things that depend on the climate. There are various things that happen to oxygen isotopes that depend on the temperature at which rain condenses. There are various things that happen to the shells of small organisms in the, in the ocean that depend on the temperature at which that shell was made. There are trees that grow or don't grow depending on uh, how warm or how dry or how wet the climate is. There are stalagmites that preserve a record of the temperature of the cave in which they're growing. There are corals that do the same thing in the sea where they grow. And so, you know, we've, we've, we've tried to find these geochemical traces that, that are affected by climate, these biological traces. There's lots of different ways that we can gain insight into how climate has changed in the past. And of course, you know, I mean, the existence of the ice ages was first kind of noticed when people started noticing, you know, erratic rocks in places that they couldn't explain how they got there until they worked out that they'd been carried by massive glaciers that had long since gone. So we can see, if you look carefully, you, you can see the impact of climate on the landscape and more qualitative, more quantitatively, you can see the impacts of climate change in the geochemistry of soils and ocean sediments and ice cores and trees and rocks and, and, and things. And so you, you put those together, you have to be very careful, you have to be, you know, you have to be very careful about how old things are and whether they've been affected by other things since then. But we have records from all over the world now, from multiple different uh, sources of evidence. And so that we can we can put together a pretty good an accurate view of, you know, what's been happening over time. And uh, obviously, the further back you go, the more opaque it becomes. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have good information for, you know, the last thousand years, we have okay information for the last 10,000 years, we have pretty good okay information for, you know, the, the Quaternary Ice Age period, you know, for the Cenozoic, you know, since the since the end of the dinosaurs, you know, we've got a pretty good idea about what's going on. Going back back beyond that, 
it gets a little hazier, but you still know that the Cretaceous was warm and the Jurassic was warm and that there was an ice age in the, uh, I can't even pronounce it, the, uh, the Oligocene. <laughs> uh, you know, so we can, not the Oligocene, no, it's the, uh, uh, begins with an O, you can, you can put that in afterwards. We know we, we have evidence that there were, there were snowball Earth episodes when basically the entire Earth glaciated. And the last time that happened was around 700 million years ago. I mean, that's, you know, so we have that information. We, and we, we can put together, and, we, and we've been working with, um, uh, with folks at the uh, Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History uh, to put together a, a view of, you know, the global mean temperature change, you know, over the last... 500 million years, which kind of goes back to before there were really land plants or animals. And so, so, you know, we have, you know, we we can see kind of what's been happening. I mean, obviously not to the detail that we can see what's going on now, but but we have, we have this ability to go back in time and and kind of see what was going on. And and that's, that's a fascinating topic. And a potentially useful one. I guess uh, one of the things we haven't touched on quite yet is um, for projecting future climate change, there's a various uncertainties, but the, the headline or one of the headline uncertainties is the climate sensitivity, how much the planet will warm in response to a given amount, a given increase in greenhouse forcing. What can we learn from these paleo climate proxies that can help us constrain these estimates? How, how useful could they be? So the answer is very useful. The fact of the matter is, is that the period when we've got the great information, right, is kind of like since the satellite started, like 1979, 1980, right? We have great information. Not perfect, but great information. But the changes since 1970, you know, have been about half a degree or so. Now, that's, that's the thing, and, that, and that's important. It's having impacts. But what people are projecting for what could happen in 2100, right, if we keep burning all the carbon dioxide, if we do this and the other, is effectively an order of magnitude bigger than that, right? So four or five degrees Celsius warming, you know, that's the, those are really, really big numbers and comparable to how cold the ice age was 20,000 years ago. And so, but we're doing that not in, not in a 10,000 year deglaciation, we're doing that in 100 years, right? So that's a, it's, <laughs> it's a big deal. And, and so, so you look at those projections and you go, well, how do you know that they're credible, right? And it turns out that that depends on this number that you mentioned, the, the equilibrium climate sensitivity. Well, how much does the planet warm when you increase the amount of carbon dioxide? And it turns out that that's a good number for estimating a lot of the impacts that you see, not just for carbon dioxide, but also for solar forcing and, and, and other changes. It's, it's a good metric that explains how sensitive the model is to different things happening. And you want to know that the model's estimate of these things is, is realistic, right? I mean, you can't just look at the last 40 years because you could get the last 40 years, right? But you could still be totally wrong when you go out 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, right? And so you need to find times and events uh, in the past that are commensurate with the size of the projected warming. So you need to find information about climate changes in the past that are on the same order of magnitude as what we're projecting going forward. And luckily, we do have such examples. We have, we have the last glacial maximum, which was about 20,000 years ago, when the temperatures were around six degrees colder than they were in the pre-industrial. And so that's actually the right level of thing. So, so the question is, can the models match the last glacial maximum temperature? right? We have the Pliocene, which was a period about 3 million years ago, which we think was the last time that carbon dioxide was as high as we're seeing now. And the temperatures are about 3 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial. So do we get that right? right? Do we understand that? And we can go back further. We can go to the Eocene, where it was warmer still. Uh, we can look at the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, when there was this very short period where temperatures ran up uh, you know, by about 5 degrees Celsius and had all sorts of impacts on, on, uh, on the climate, but just for a very short time. Uh, you know, can we understand that? Can we, can we t- use these same models to match that data there? And so the answer is yes. And so that gives us constraints on what that climate sensitivity might be. And, and, and pretty much those paleoclimate records rule out really high climate sensitivities. They, they rule out things kind of above five degrees Celsius for a doubling of CO2, which is good news, right? But they also rule out very low climate sensitivities, right? So something less than, than two. It, it, it becomes impossible to explain the paleoclimate if, if the climate is not very sensitive, right? Because 
things have changed. And so we can use that paleo climate data uh, to constrain what we want to, what, what we think is going to happen in the future, regardless of what the models are saying. And then we can then evaluate the models and say, okay, well, is this model going to work for this? And if it doesn't, you can throw it out. That's fine. I just wanted to wrap this section up by coming back to the relatively modern period. Uh, we started off by talking about how global warming was detected and, and now attributed unequivocally to human actions. But I want to go back. In 1988, Hansen declared in his Senate testimony that he was 99% sure that we're already seeing the effects of climate change. Did he jump the gun or could someone have made that claim a decade earlier? That's a very interesting question. So the, so the answer is that he was reporting what, he, what, what his model had demonstrated. And, and he was right. He said that that in 1998, the temperatures were such that, you know, this was three sigma above the changes that we, you would expect. For, for folks that, that aren't aware, you know, a two sigma event is something that can happen, you know, maybe, maybe one in 20 times. A three sigma event is like one in a hundred times. Four sigma, five sigma is becomes very, very unlikely. And so the gold standard for discovering new particles or announcing that you've discovered gravitational waves has generally been a five sigma. You know, that's when you're so far away from the null hypothesis or the, the the no change case that you know something has happened, right? And and if you're and if you can match what you see has happened using your theory, then you know you have an attribution. So Hansen, when he said, "Okay, I'm 99 percent sure," he's saying we think that the warming in 1998 is a three sigma event, and we know you know historically that you know you get three sigma events, you get two sigma events, right? And you, and you don't want to be too dogmatic about something that just is like a two sigma event right that we i mean we mentioned that with respect to the hiatus you know it was a kind of a two sigma event for a little bit and it went away again, right so it wasn't there wasn't anything real there and so when uh when hansen said that he said okay well this is a three sigma event but then so then other people said well but it's only a three sigma event you know and there might be some structural errors you know this is just based on your model what about somebody else's model and, and those were those were valid those are valid criticisms, though the tone of the conversation at that time was strange. <laughs> I mean, you go you go back and read some of the uh, some of the commentary. Uh, there were some people that were way overconfident in their rejection of of Hansen's conclusion based on nothing, as far as I can see. We can go back now and we can say, when did? that signal emerge. You now we've got we've got better observations, we've got better models. And you can ask, you know, what, when did the the greenhouse signal come out of that three sigma uh, level? And the answer was, you know, in the in the early 1980s. And so, you know, Hanson Hansen said it, called it, and was right. And so, you know, we we look back on that on that declaration, global warming is here. And uh, I think he said the greenhouse effect is here, which is kind of how they talked about it. And, 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 he, was, and he was right. And so he gets, he gets the kudos for that. And the people that said, well, what about this? What about that? You know, like they have mostly passed into obscurity. Them's the breaks. Such public announcements and public communication have been essential for moving climate action into policy. And you yourself, in addition to being a scientist, have been involved in climate science communication, in particular since co-founding blog realclimate.org in 2004. And at the time, denialism, if you will, or strong skepticism of human-caused climate change was a significant voice in the political discourse. From my perspective, I don't hear so much outright denial or deep skepticism that climate change is happening, it's something different. We have Steve Coonan, for example, saying, well, maybe we should have red teaming of climate science. And the overall emphasis is more around the policy and the economic impacts of aggressive mitigation. Is my observation right that the resistance to climate action has fundamentally changed over the last 20 years? And if so, are climate communicators such as yourself keeping up with that shift? Are you fighting today's battle, or are you perhaps lagging and fighting the battles of yester decade? All right, there's a lot to unpack there, and and I think you're right on most of what you say. 
Except that when you say, okay, the, 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 the denial things uh, have now moved to opposing climate action, that was always what they were doing. They were just using different tactics. So, you know, they haven't changed their spots. They're the same people that don't want us to do anything about anything ever. You know, and, and it turns out that they don't want us to do anything about any problem, right? They're, they, they're the same people who didn't want to do anything about COVID. They're the same people that didn't want to do anything about ozone depletion or who didn't want to do anything about acid rain. The commonality is they don't want us to do anything, right? So all of the discussions about urban heat islands and climate models and sensitivity, all of those things are just kind of useful tropes that, that people use because they have traction. And once they no longer have traction, they're discarded like yesterday's newspapers. And uh, they no longer have traction. So those kinds of uh, arguments no longer have traction because the situation on the ground has changed. You know, the, the, imp, the, the warming is, is, as we say, unequivocal. Like arguing against that, it just makes you look silly. Arguing that it's not having any impact on extreme heat or extreme rainfall or sea level just makes you look silly. And so they've just switched arguments, but, but their, their motivations are the same as they ever were. You know, so, so the role of climate communication, you know, it has, it, has, it has shifted over the last 20 years because 20 years ago, there were these claims that were being made, usually in bad faith, but nonetheless, people would, would hear them and then, well, what is the story there? What is, how do you put together the global temperature data? How do you build a model? How do you do the attribution? How do you do? I mean, so all of those questions were valid questions and that, you know, it was important for people to explain how we did those things. And now they're not raised as much, but they're still interesting questions. And, you know, you've been asking me these kind of questions all this morning as well. And they're not, I mean, they're, they're interesting. How do we do science? How do we know anything? And, and I find that fascinating and lots of other people do too. So there's still, there's still a need for uh, the people who are working on that kind of stuff to explain how we go about doing things and why we continue to do things and, and, and what the uncertainties are and where we're, we're now looking for, for further information. But the, but the impacts and, you know, and the solutions uh, to, to climate change and to, you know, how you reduce emissions and, you know, all of those things, they're still valid conversations too. It's slightly, but it's a different group of folks who can tell you what the impact of installing more heat pumps in the UK is going to be on, you know, your need for uh, the imports of Russian gas. I mean, that's not something that, you know, is part of the climate model or part of my background, though I'm not uh, unfamiliar with those, with those kinds of arguments. But, but there are lots of people who are working in this area who are now kind of stepping up and talking about how you actually make the energy transition. And all good luck to them. I, you know, I, these are really quite interesting questions. And, and, and I think it's right that people are asking those questions. But we shouldn't have all our conversations driven by people who've been making bad faith, bad faith arguments about this whole situation for the last 40 years. That brings up a challenge that climate communicators have, and that's where to draw the line for legitimate debate. One can imagine that raising concerns about, let's say, urban heat island effect or the effect of aerosols or whatnot, certainly earlier on, given the stakes of climate change and the significant costs of aggressive climate action, can be reasonable questions and concerns. At a certain point in time, these issues have been addressed and it's time to move on. And at a certain point in time, certainly from some actors, it is reasonable to question their motives. So the balance here is what is acceptable, what is debatable, what is it time to just put aside. What I've seen more recently is among some communicators of climate change is an expansion of what should be not considered to include advocacy of nuclear power, that renewables cannot meet our energy demand, or a de-emphasis on systematic change. In this evolving environment, how should we collectively think about what's the legitimate scope of debate about climate action? Well, what, what you're talking about there is, is really what is salient at, at, at any one time. And that, that's a moving target. And, uh, you know, if you, if you read about things like the Overton window, we, we seem to have limits in arguments that are 
taken seriously. And it's not anybody's one, it's not one person's decision, but you can see, for instance, you know, the difference in, in discussions of healthcare in the US versus the UK, that there's, there's, no, there's no point of overlap, right? So in the, in the UK, the notion that you would do away with the National Health Service is basically just a non-starter, right? Nobody who makes that argument is taken seriously. But in the US, the notion that you would have a National Health Service is similarly taken so unseriously that anybody that makes it is just instantly dismissed. And so, so the, the spheres of what is you know, acceptable conversation are very culturally and politically dependent and are not, you know, I, I don't control that. And I don't control it when it comes to the health systems. I don't control it when it comes to sources of energy. I don't control it when it comes to, you know, economic, um, economic impacts and things. And so what you note if you pay attention to this, is that those boundaries shift and they shift as a function of events. You know, after there was this, there was this uh, event, Climate Gate, there's a whole bunch of emails that were hacked and then released. That shifted that Overton window so that there was a whole bunch of mothers who were suddenly getting major media attention. But that, but that, that faded. That was a moment that's gone. And now, you know, outright denial does not get much traction on the BBC or on the the, the broadcast news in the uh, in the US. That that the moment for that has passed, and so you know the people who want us not to do anything shift to other topics. You know, I mean, my own personal opinion about the use of nuclear power is not that off from the mainstream. You know, I, I, you know, it's it's expensive, but you know, for the stuff that we have already ongoing, you know, I wouldn't turn it off. And so there's there's some there's some discussion about that. But but these are these are not outrageous points of view. I mean, like there's you know these are these are very mainstream conversations. So I'm, I'm not I'm not really seeing these seeing these things uh, be written out of uh, the popular discourse. You know the the energy transition that will inevitably happen, right? It's just a question of time when it will happen to a fully renewable with storage with you know with with geothermal and hydro and all the rest of it. Uh, it, it will happen, right? Because eventually it, it, it's going to have to happen. But you know how fast does that happen? You know those are those are totally valid questions. I mean, you mentioned Steve Coonan earlier. You know, he pretends to be arguing about climate data, but it's just, you know, cherry picks random things that he doesn't really understand, but all in service of, you know, his policy goal, which is to do nothing. And so, you know, it, it's, it's pretty transparent when that happens. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, do I think that we should do nothing? Absolutely not. I, you know, do I think that it's so that the cost of not doing anything are, are less than the cost of doing something? No. And I think that there's a lot of evidence to support that. You know, so when people argue that, you know, for whatever reason, one should not do anything, despite the fact that solar power is now the cheapest power in a lot of the lot of the world, that wind power is now the cheapest power in a lot of parts of the world, that storage capacity and biotechnology have been crashing in prices. You know, I mean, the, the transition is happening. And the people who are kind of like, you know, like King Canute, is standing at the shore saying, no, the tide of clean energy must stop. They're going to be as successful as he was. Another trend that I've perceived in the climate change conversation is an increasing emphasis among some science writers and advocates of climate action on worst case scenarios. I've also observed, and this has been seen in survey data, increasing rise in anxiety and depression among the young concerning climate change. I get the sense that these things are perhaps connected. And that's one thing that worries me about such communication that emphasizes these worst case scenarios. But these outcomes are possible. They're not out of the question. They're just high impact, low probability outcomes. What's the proper balance for climate communicators to convey this in a way that is responsible and effective. Yeah, I mean, that, that this, this is something that, that goes back a long way, of course. And, and actually, Steve Schneider, who was, you know, one of the early climate communicators, you know, said, you know, very clearly at one point, the best case outcome and the worst case outcome are the least probable of any of the outcomes. But you need to look at what the worst case outcomes are because, you know, often what we see is that the impacts of anything 
happen at the tails. Like, so the impacts of climate change are not in the global mean temperature changing, but the impact that that has on extremes and the, and the cost of extremes, whether it's coastal flooding or heat waves or massive amounts of rainfall, those are, you know, they weight the costs of the whole thing towards those extreme events. And so it's, it's, you do need to think about them. You know, you can't just assume that the middle of the road is where things are going to go because things can get worse and you need to be able to prepare and hedge against that. You know, but, but then that's, that's quite different to saying, you know, definitively, oh my God, there's a methane bomb that's going to go off and the temperatures are going to increase by two degrees in the next 20 years. You know, so that's nonsense, right? It, that, when people are just kind of, you know, making stuff up or, yeah, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I see that and I have seen it for many decades, there, there, are, there are people out there who just like the kind of climate disaster porn. And, you know, and every random misapprehension and misstatement of somebody is built into, oh my God, you know, you know the, the sea level is going to rise uh, six feet in a week. And you know, the answer is no, no, none of those things are going to happen. But some things could happen. And I think, I think you, know, uh, you know, responsible discussion about that has, has to acknowledge that things are plausible but also has to kind of stamp down on, you know, people that are just, uh, you know, effectively making things up and making it sound much worse than it is. I mean, it's bad enough. You don't need to make anything up. And so I now, which I didn't 10 years ago, spend quite a lot of time kind of damping down the ill thought out mistakes on the, it's going to get much worse side than it is, you know, the people that are kind of making things up and cherry picking things to, to make it sound like nothing's going to happen. And so that's, that's an interesting place for, for scientists to be, but it's actually the right place for scientists to be, right? Because, because back in the day when the poles of the debates were the people that were in total denial versus the scientists, right? People just kind of assumed that the truth was somewhere in between. That, that, was, that, was, not, that was not correct then, but those were the, the two poles of the debate. So now, the outright denial has gone away as a politically salient force. And so now the distribution of opinion among scientists is the distribution of opinion. And, and so there's people who are more optimistic, there are people who are more pessimistic, and the communicators now find themselves in the middle, kind of like battling against people at, at either fat tail, if you like. And I, and I think that that's that's been a bit of a shock to some people who talk about this in public, uh, but I think that that's actually the right place to be because, you know, wh where, there, where there really is genuine uncertainty, we have to acknowledge it. To wrap up, how, how optimistic are you about our, our chances of dealing with climate change and uh, what gives you hope for the future? So I'm more optimistic than I was a few years ago. The last year, I was more tied into uh, what was happening in Washington, D.C. Than, uh, than I had been up until then for obvious reasons. And there's a lot of efforts across a lot of different fronts in the U.S. that are, that are pushing things in the right direction. And that, that's, that's been heartening. And, and I see how things are, are, are moving in other parts of the world. And I see how technology is changing. And I see how the costs of new technology are uh, dropping. And I see you know, people and countries making commitments, if not totally committing to those commitments, uh, when it comes to emissions. And, and yes, you know, we're finally moving in the right direction at, the, at a rate that's commensurate with the size of the problem. That's not to say that everything is done, because you know, there's obviously still people who want to burn it all. And there's still people who, uh, who, who don't want us to do anything. And, and to the extent that they gain power or have influence, then, then I've become more pessimistic. And so my, you know, my, my kind of feeling about all of this is not really a function of what we're seeing in the data, though that, that does have an impact, but more on how society reacts to the data. And when it's reacting in what I consider to be the, the right way, I'm more optimistic. And when, and when I see that's not happening, then I'm more pessimistic. And, uh, uh, but I've been more optimistic than pessimistic in, in, in the last year or so. And so I'm hoping that that will continue. All right. Well, thank you very much, Gavin, for joining us. That was really interesting. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks for listening. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere. And please consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash challengingclimate.